middle of talking about cyclic AMP, second messenger system. Okay, so once cyclic AMP, which is our second messenger, is activated or converted from uh, converted from ATP, it's going to activate a protein kinase. We're going to call that protein kinase PKA. PKA protein kinase A stands for cyclic AMP dependent protein kinase. And the way that <clears throat> cyclic AMP um, I'm way behind right now. There we go. The way that cyclic AMP is going to work in its inactive form it has multiple subunits. Two different subunits. One shown here kind of in a yellowish color, orange color, and then the other one shown in this kind of grayish, blackish color. In the presence of cyclic AMP, those two subunits dissociate. When the subunits are associated, they're inactive, or it's an inactive protein kinase. When cyclic AMP is added in, they dissociate, that regulatory subunit comes off of the molecule, and this opens up or activates the protein kinase. And what do all kinases do? Yep. And so we're going to turn on a phosphorylation of it. Uh, ability to phosphorylate. And phosphorylation results in other proteins either being turned on or off. And as we turn on and off those proteins, we turn on and off physiology, or we change the physiology. Now, what's pretty interesting about a second messenger system is it has built in an ability to be amplified. So what that means is that we can have a very small signal, a couple hormones, molecules, but this can still initiate or elicit a large cellular effect. And the way that this works is that each step along the way, be increasingly processed. So in other words, from just a single hormone, single molecule, we may end up with not just one, but several protein kinase A's being activated. And so we don't just get one protein kinase that's going through and phosphorylating. We have multiple protein kinases that are phosphorylating, so we can get lots of response. So adenylate cyclase is turned up, and a bunch of ATP can catalyze and convert it over into cyclic AMP. Now, I do want to talk a little bit more about what's going on here in this part of the feed. How do we go from the hormone to activation of the enzyme adenylate cyclase? abbreviation HR there is the hormone receptor. So how do we create the hormone receptor complex and link that to the function of the dentalate cyclase? And it's all going to be centered around the activity of our G protein that's linked to this particular receptor. Right? So this hormone receptor is a G protein linked receptor. So we have to have this process where we take and activate the GTP that's coupled to the G protein. The G protein is going to be uh, comprised of 
multiple subunits. And under unstimulated circumstances, those subunits are classified as inactive. Now the main subunits that we have are the alpha, beta, and gamma subunits. Okay, so we have alpha, beta, and gamma subunits. So when there is no hormone bound up on the receptor, you actually have a GDP molecule that's bound to the subunits that helps out in the inactivation process. And then when that receptor is bound by a hormone, the first thing that's going to happen is that GDP molecule is going to be released. Okay, so this falls off of the subunit. As that falls off of the subunits, it opens up an active site for a new GTP molecule. And so after that GDP moves out of the way to remove that steric hindrance induced by the GDP, and the G, a new GTP will bind, and it binds specifically on a catalytic site on the alpha sub. Now, in this picture, it's a little deceiving because it shows that the GDP kind of falls off. Really what happens is GTP binds to the alpha subunit. We catalyze that bond. This is a phosphorylated hydride bond. It's a high energy bond. That gives energy to that alpha subunit. So that alpha subunit now can undergo a process to bind to adenylate cyclones. This is all functional because that alpha subunit has a moiety or has a region within that protein that is uh, going to have GTPase activity. It's going to have the ability to break that phosphorylated hydride bond, release that energy, and utilize that energy for useful work. Now, in that process, we have GTP that's converted back to GDP. And once we're converted back to GDP, we're now back in that inactive state. Now, up here in the figure, it kind of shows adenylate cyclase. It looks like a, maybe an intermembrane protein or a peripheral protein, and the G protein sort of moves and translocates. Chances are the adenylate cyclase is really close to that receptor. And we have some sort of positional change that occurs when GTP activates the G protein to interact with the dentalate cyclase. And that, that bond or that interaction between the, the subunit, alpha subunit, and adenylate cyclase uh, occurs not because the GTP is moving across the membrane. It's possible it does, but it's probably, um, this is all probably rafted together. We've talked about that before in other classes, the fluid mosaic model you have proteins of similar chemical pathways that get all kind of bound up together in the same patches of membrane and they kind of float around together and are called rafts. So that's probably what's happening here as well. So once that catalyzation process occurs, where the GTP is converted into GDP and we reinactivate, the interaction that was created between the G protein, the alpha subunit, and adenylate cyclase is actually going to cease. And so that alpha subunit is released from adenylate cyclase and it settles back into the beta and gamma 
subunits, and we go back to that inactive complex. Okay. Now, it turns out that the alpha, the beta, and the gamma subunits are all classes or families of proteins. And we have different types of G proteins that exist in biology. And so I want to take just a moment here to kind of go through some of these different types of G proteins. This is a kind of a fuzzy picture. Um, <clears throat> But what you can see is you have different receptors that all have different kind of combinations of different types of G proteins, and they all initiate different signaling pathways. A couple of things that you probably will recognize here. This is a cyclic AMP, second messenger system here. Here's phospholipase C. You all remember that from a PIP2 pathway. Uh, there's a couple. Of, these are actually phosphorylation cascades. Um, this, this particular one in the middle leads towards a, a, a protein called ERK12, which is another, another kinase protein. Um, and, and really, this came from a, uh, a uh, paper that was talking about upregulating the gene, and they were using a luciferase before a construct. So that's what this is talking about here. This isn't, um, don't interpret that as saying, oh, this is what happens in a fruit fly or in a, in a lightning bug. It's, it's a reporter construct. So you can kind of ignore the bottom of the figure. I just was kind of interested in showing you these different interactions and that they lead to different pathways and just kind of interpret this bottom part as that's our chain of sudden Okay, so the different types of G proteins have different alpha subunits. It's an alpha subunit that really dictates the kind of G protein. Uh, that is going to be utilized by an individual receptor. And it turns out that these alpha subunits are pretty diverse. So we have a lot of different types of alpha subunits. And the nomenclature that we use here to define uh, our alpha subunits, our different types of alpha subunits, is we use a, a dual or a double sub, uh, subscript. So, for example, that would be our symbology for the alpha subunit of the G protein. And then we get another superscripted letter, letter there below the alpha, in this case, S. And this is a G protein that's known as the stimulatory alpha subunit. And so we'll have stimulatory effects. And it turns out that this G alpha S is usually what's associated with adenylate cyclase. So adenylate cyclase will be activated when we activate G alpha S. And there's a host of different hormones that will use the G alpha S epinephrine, glucagon, luteinizing hormone, parathyroid, parathyroid hormone, uh, and adrenal, adrenal corticotropic hormone, or ACTH. Another type of G protein or alpha subunit is G alpha Q. This is also going to have a stimulatory effect. And this will lead to activation of another hormone or another uh, enzyme that you're all pretty familiar with, and that's PLC phospholipase C. Hopefully, you recognize that as uh, the uh, enzyme that begins the PIP2 pathway leads towards production of IP3 and GAG calcium regulation. So G alpha S goes to adenylate cyclase, G alpha Q goes to phospholipase C, uh, a series of different hormones utilize this particular mechanism. Uh, Antidiuretic hormone, also known as vasopressin, angiotensin 2, calcitonin. Uh, and also histamine. 
a third G alpha subunit is G alpha I, and this has some inhibitory effects. Inhibitory effects. This particular G protein has the effect of blocking the function of the dentolate cycles. So whenever you activate a G-linked protein receptor that has the alpha I subunit, you're going to stop the production of cyclic AMP. Yeah, G alpha I. So this will stop the production of cyclic AMP. And again, we have several different uh, hormones that are uh, going to utilize this type of mechanism when we downregulate cyclic AMP, melatonin, the prostaglandins, dopamine functions in this fashion. G alpha T, this has stimulatory effects as well. Sometimes you'll hear that T referred to as transducin. This is going to be a alpha subunit that when its receptor is activated, results in upregulation or activation of phosphodiester 6. Phosphodiesterase 6. Um, this is actually the G protein that we find in the rhodopsin receptor, which is one of our uh, receptors that we have in um, signaling for vision. This is kind of an interesting mechanism because it's actually the rhodopsin receptor's ligand is a photon of light. Phosphodiesterase 6. So the rhodopsin receptor has this transducin, this uh, G alpha T G protein, uh, or G alpha, G alpha subunit, and it is going to activate that particular enzyme, the phosphodiesterase 6. We see this in the rhodopsin receptor, the ligand for the rhodopsin receptor it is the photon of light. And it's going to lead towards signals that get sent into the central nervous system of an organism where the information is processed and converted into chlorophyll as a decision. Now, I do bring up G alpha T just because we're going through and doing the survey of different G protein sub alpha subunits. This is a non hormone G protein subunit. We don't ever see, as, as far as we know, the hormones that we have characterized so far, none have used this particular G protein mechanism. So this appears to be pretty exclusive to the transduction of vision. Now, in, in all reality, there are several other Several other uh, alpha subunits that all cause different things to happen inside of the cell when their receptor is bound to lead towards different pathways. Now we have two other subunits. 
have the beta and the gamma subunits. And the beta and the gamma subunits, their main purpose in a G protein is to help dock the alpha subunit in place on the receptor. However, there's been some recent char characterizations of the beta and the uh, gamma subunits and some proposed additional additional roles. So there's some suggestion that these subunits can specifically outside of the alpha subunit stimulate ion channels cause up function of ion channels. They've also been suggested to be able to also stimulate the um, activity of different phosphodiesterases. Appear to have some regulatory role in the function of adenylate cyclase. So while they may not activate adenylate cyclase, they may actually enhance or um, reduce the function of adenylate cyclase. Roles. Roles. So there's some proposed additional roles for small. Subterranean mammals and rodents. <laughs> this whole class is just about endocrinology and mold. You didn't know that. Nothing that we're talking about applies to humans at all. <laughs> Alright, so cyclic AMP, we know cyclic AMP upregulate protein kinase A. But there's actually another target for cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP also can interact with the genome and can up and down regulate production of, of genes. So we can increase the phosphorylation capacity of the cell by increasing or activating PKA, but we can also modify the expression of genes. And so the way that this that this is going to happen, I know this is really, really complex, but it should be relatively familiar. So here's the dentalate cyclase here. Okay? Over here, this is a, um, a PIP2 pathway that leads towards AKT. You can kind of ignore all of this side of the of the um, all of this side of the pathway. Over here on this side of, of the figure, you have a G protein linked receptor activating the denylate cyclase. We start producing cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP activates protein kinase A. You'll also see that protein kinase A will target a molecule and phosphorylate a molecule called CREV. C R E V. So cyclic AMP activates PKA. We already know this. Normally, PKA, or one of the things that PKA does a lot of, is out here in the cytosol, we just start turning on new proteins. We just start phosphorylating them. We upregulate their activity. One of the proteins that will be activated occasionally is this protein C R E V CREV. So PKA will phosphorylate CREV. We put a phosphate on that protein. That protein becomes activated. What CREV stands for sorry, I'm getting a little bit off of my memory. This should be a, a two. PKA phosphorylates CREV. And then one 
Cream is cyclic AMP response element binding protein. You can see why we just call it cream. What is a response element? Anyone know what a response element is? A response element is a small sequence of DNA that can bind to proteins. Those proteins will act as transcription factors. So CREEB has a specific sequence on the DNA that it can bind to, and it will upregulate or downregulate, inhibit it, transcription of a gene from it. So the specific sequence is called the CRP. So CREEB binds CREEB, the CRE. And the CRE is just going to be the cyclic AMP response element. And this is just simply a DNA sequence. Right, so this is a section of the DNA, nucleotides on the DNA, with a specific sequence. Where this protein that's phosphorylated by PKA can bind. So the cyclic AMP response element. Is that a one that's This guy right here? Yeah. It is. So if this is a strand of DNA, I know it doesn't look like it. going to have a sequence of nucleotides on that DNA that acts as a cyclic AMP response element. When it is phosphorylated, not creed, creed. <laughs> creed will come down and will bind to creed, or see the CRE, the cyclic AMP response element. And this results in, very frequently, I think I'm spelling this right, I don't know, no. upregulation of transcription. So we convert that DNA over into a messenger RNA molecule. We have a new message that now can be converted over towards a protein. Okay. Which is similar to what you see going on down here. They're just more more things that are happening, more stuff that's happening. And so the net result here is for there to be a cell-specific production of a messenger RNA molecule that can now be utilized through translation to produce a protein. Is that the thing that's It's the phosphate. Yeah, that's a uh, phosphate that gets added on. Without it, it's inactive and won't bind to the CRE. So that's literally what the PKA does. Well, it, it is, yeah. Um, so inorganic phosphates popped onto, uh, popped onto a protein. That specific um, chemical group will change the nature of the protein and change its function. Because what's, what's the rule here when, when you're dealing with proteins? Whenever you bind the protein, it changes shape and its function, right? So if we bind this phosphate to creep, it probably does something 
where it opens up the ability or creates the ability now that it can actually interact with the nucleotides. Before that, it, did, it, it, it could not. And so even though it may bump into the DNA in a Brownian motion, right, inside the cell, it bumps into it, doesn't have a conducive chemical environment, gets phosphorylated, and now it does, binds up transcription leading towards the mRNA. Now, the other pathway that you should be relatively familiar with is um, phospholipase C, the, the PIP2 pathway. So here's an example of the PIP2 pathway. Here's our G-alpha-Q, G protein. You have the hormone that binds up onto the receptor, and we're going to activate PLC, phospholipase C, and it's going to interact with this molecule called PIP2 and produces a molecule called DAG, diacylglycerol, and a molecule called icotrinitositol triphosphate. And then we have some changes here in calcium handling inside of the cell. So G alpha Q acts in the PIP2 pathway. And again, this is phospho, phosphatol, or 5 by phosphate. Phospho and acetal, 4 by by this is a lipid that is going to end up in the membrane. So it's actually a phospholipid because it's phosphorylated. So it's in the membrane. It's one of our uh, one of our membrane uh, lipids. PIP, I'm sorry, uh, PLC rather, phospholipase C. Anyone know what a lipase is or what a lipase will do? If you take a look at the word, you actually can kind of figure out at first what it's acting on. It's actually acting on phospholipids, right? That's why it's a phospholipase. And lip, lipases are going to split or cleave lipid molecules, right? We're going to break that lipid molecule apart. So phospholipase C, when it is activated and turned on and interacts with phospho and acetal 4 5 biphosphate, it splits that molecule into IP3 and this other molecule called DAG, or DAG, or diacylglycerol, okay? So you end up with two molecules split out from our individual PIP2. So IP3, inositol, 1, 4, 5, triphosphate. Now, what's interesting about inositol 145 triphosphate is it now is a water soluble molecule. That means it's no longer going to associate with the membrane. It's actually going to move out into the aqueous environment of the cell, move into the cytosol. The other molecule actually is still lipid in nature. In nature. It's a molecule called diacylglycerol. Okay? So I end up with one of the molecules remaining in the membrane, the diacylglycerol, and one of the molecules moving into the cell, into the cytosol, the inositol 145 triphosphate. That means I have two new molecules that have been produced that can act in two locations, in the membrane and in the cytosol. IP3 is going to act in the cytosol to increase the calcium load in the cytosol. 
All right, so where do I get calcium from? Well, it's high outside of the cell. It's also so stored inside of the endoplasmic reticulum. And so we're going to interact with channels in the endoplasmic reticulum, also in some cases out in the, in the, from the membrane, to move calcium into the cytosol. So we increase calcium levels in the cytosol. Okay, so that's kind of the first thing that's happening here. Now, diacylglycerol still hanging out associated with the membrane. Nearby the membrane, and in fact, it's probably a peripheral protein, is a pro another protein kinase. It's called protein kinase C. So diacylglycerol has the ability to activate protein kinase C. Now, usually when this happens, when it's most conducive to activate protein kinase C, is when diacylglycerol is in the presence of elevated calcium. Well, we just achieved el uh, uh, elevated calcium because of the mechanism driven by IV3. Now, the reason that this happens is because, you know, I probably misspoke here just a second ago. Uh, I said protein kinase C is a peripheral protein, and that's, that's a half truth. It becomes a peripheral protein when calcium levels are high, and so that's how it gets activated here. So it's going to be activated when it's in its peripheral protein uh, um, structure, I guess you would say. So PKC, in the presence of high levels of calcium, translocates to the membrane to become a peripheral protein. It now has the ability to interact with diacylglycerol. It gets activated in its active form. PKC is a serine threonine protein kinase. So what exactly does that mean? Those are the two amino acid residues that this protein kinase will phosphorylate. So any place you have a serine or a threonine, those are possible targets for phosphorylation from protein kinase once it gets activated. Okay? Is this all kind of making sense? Calcium levels go up, PKC goes up to the membrane, interact with DAG, it's activated, it's now got the serine threonine protein kinase activity. Wherever you have serines and threonines and other proteins, those amino acids now can be phosphorylated, changing the activity of those proteins. Now one protein in particular that's going to be affected by this is a protein called Kelmodulin. And as you can see just from its name, it's going to be involved in the modulation of calcium. Calmodulin, calmodulin happens to be ubiquitous. What ubiquitous means is that we just find it in all different types of cells. It's not specific to any one cell type. And so it's found ubiquitously throughout all different cell types. specifically within unique eukaryotes. So eukaryotic cells, they will have kelmodulin. Now, normally on its own, it just is sort of hanging out in the cell. And so it's inactive. Inactive when alone. But as you can see over here in this picture, we have calcium stores where calcium levels begin to increase. PKC goes up, interacts with diacylglycerol becomes a serine threonine protein kinase. Also going on in here, you got calmodulin. It has four different binding sites for calcium. Normally, calcium levels are really low in the cell. It's not binding, it's not interacting at all. So it's inactive when it's alone. But when calcium levels spike in the cell, 
those four calcium binding sites, they can now begin to come out. When they are bound, calmodulin becomes a calcium calmodulin compound. Okay, so calcium calmodulin compound. Now, with those four calcium molecules associated with calmodulin, forming the calcium calmodulin compound, we start to do what the name suggests, and we start to regulate intracellular calcium. So we start to regulate those intracellular calcium levels. And the other thing that we do is we now activate another protein. Which is known as the calmodulin dependent protein kinase. Calmodulin dependent protein kinase or CAM kinase times it's abbreviated. Or here even further, sometimes just simply KK. And once we get that particular kinase, we now see additional phosphorylation that begins to occur alongside of PKC activity. So a lot of stuff happening here with the PIP2 pathway. Hormone binds. It's the G protein. We go through that uh, catalysis of GTP into GDP in the process. Interact with PLC to activate PLC. PLC splits up or cleaves PIP2 into IP3. IP3 upregulates calcium in the cell. As calcium upregulates in the cell, you have PK. C that moves up to the membrane is activated by diacylglycerol, becomes a serine threonine protein kinase, and starts phosphorylating proteins. Also with calcium, as it increases in the cell, we activate calmodulin that act activates CAM kinase. CAM kinase also begins to phosphorylate proteins. And as we phosphorylate more and more proteins, we get more and more activity that builds up in the cell. So at a minimum, it would be good to be familiar with the cyclic AMP second messenger system and the PIP2 pathway. Uh, I have another, um, another couple of pathways I'm going to show you. But for starters, start learning what's going on biologically, molecularly with protein kinase activation in both PIP2 and cyclic AMP. All right, so another class of hormone that we briefly touched on already were the eicosanoids. So here is a picture. That's not a real good picture. Let's see if we can increase its size here real quick. Not totally clear, but um, okay. So the acosinoids. If you remember, the acosinoids are the hormones that, are, that start from arachidonic acid. Okay, so here's our arachidonic acid. That's a cell membrane phospholipid. And we basically have all of these biochemical pathways that lead towards the production of different, um, different acosinoids. Okay, so you have a whole series of acosinoids that can be produced. And as those molecules are produced, they will begin to activate signaling pathways of their own, leading towards what we're going to call the action of the acosinoids. So here is kind of an example. Um, 
because we can see all of that. So we have some sort of extr extrinsic or external stimuli. The examples they give are hormones, hypoxia, and a change in pH. This results in some changes in the cell membrane. That's what you see here. This is the cell membrane. This is intracellular environment. This is going to be the extracellular environment. Uh, this is actually uh, another another cell. So this would be the what's called humoral space. That's extracellular support stream, things like that. So you have some sort of stimuli that results in the activation of phospholipids leading towards the production or the, the increase in this arachidonic acid. Okay, and then we synthesize through that pathway that we just saw the cosinoid hormones, prostaglandins, prostacyclines, carboxins, the leukotrienes. Okay, so we have these hormones that are being produced. And what you can see is we actually are going to end up having some nucleotide cyclase activity. We've already seen one nucleotide cyclase. Anyone remember what that was? Cyclase. Adenylate cyclase is, is one of our nucleotide cyclase enzymes. So um, the, the kind of end result here of a cosinoid activation is we're going to result in an upregulation of phospholipase A2. So we upregulate this enzyme, phospholipase A2 is activated, and I'm going to just put down Somehow. So somehow this is going to act to be activated. The result is once this enzyme is activated, is it goes through a process of releasing phospholipids from the cell membrane. And as those phosphos are, phospholipids are uh, activated or released, they get converted into arachidonic acid. So we get our precursor molecule. Now, in all fairness, we may know more about how phospholipase A2 is, is activated. Um, it's been a while since I've, I've, I've looked at to see what the updates are there. Uh, but clearly, it's going to be activated. This particular lipase, once activated, causes phospholipids to uh, be converted or, or formed into arachidonic acid, which is our precursor for the acosinase. So once we have the arachidonic acid formed, we have the biochemical ability to form other acosylates. Now, what you're actually seeing here is that those acosinate hormones, they actually have the ability to cause a cell response in the cell they're produced in, so it's an autocrine mechanism. But they also have the hormonal mechanism. But what you'll see is wherever we are, whether we're in the own cell or a target cell, nucle nucleotide cyclization is, is going to be a, a, a key enzymatic reaction that occurs in the acosinoid pathway. So in our own cell, We have activation of a nucleotide cyclase as we have the acosinoids that are increased. The acosinoids also are readily released to the blood. And this is where they're classified as a one, right? If they're released into their own cell and cause a response, they're just a signaling molecule. Once they get into the bloodstream and, start, and circulate to a target, they are classified by definition as a hormone. 
And the hormone does the same thing in the target cells it does in its own cell. And this results in activation of nucleotide cyclizing enzymes. And as you get cyclical nucleotides, things like cyclic A and P, you end up with cellular responses that occur. Okay. So the eicosanoid is kind of an interesting molecule. Uh, we have the production of that arachidonic acid from inactive phospholipids used biochemically through a series of enzymes to produce things like the prostaglandin. The prostaglandins will affect uh, cellular response in cell production, cellular response in a target cell through nucleotide cyclization. The last signaling system that I want to touch on what are known as the cytosol hormone receptors. So really, up until this point, most of what's been going on has been initiated by receptors that are transmembrane proteins, bound up in the membrane, have an extracellular phase, have an intracellular phase. There are also a series of hormone receptors that are not bound in the membrane, they are floating free or soluble within the cytosol. So this is a cell, right? This is cell membrane, this is the nuclear membrane. And so we do have these um, proteins that are just gonna be dissolved within the cytosol. The, the main hormones that utilize these particular systems are the hormones that can cross through the membrane which include the steroids and the thyroid hormones. Okay, so the precursor or, or, or the precursors are uh, lipid in nature. Okay, so the steroids and the thyroid hormones. So the mechanism that we have here. is that once we get the hormone to the cell, which we talked briefly about this already, we would have to wrap a steroid hormone because of its lipophilic nature. We'd have to wrap it up in some, um, some other protein to make that molecule less lipophilic, less hydrophobic, right? We, so we put it out on a binding protein. And so we have things like sex binding hormone, uh, globulin, right? So it grabs onto estrogen, grabs onto testosterone, it makes that molecule more, uh, more hydrophilic so that it can circulate. So once we get to the, the, the target, we actually have to release from that binding globulin. But then we can cross right through the membrane because the membrane's a lipid, so we cross right through the membrane. And the hormone ends up inside of the cell and binds one of these intracellular or cytosolic receptors. Now, depending on their action, a lot of them will be really nuclear receptors, meaning that they will go into the nucleus, okay? But sometimes the receptors remain out in the cytosol. So you kind of have two different targets is basically what I'm saying. So for example, the glucocorticoids are steroids. We actually will find them always in the cytosol. So once the hormone is inside of the cell, we may bind and end up in the nucleus or bind in the nucleus, or we may just bind and remain out in the cytosol. 
when the hormone binds one of these receptors, just like we've seen with our other signaling systems, we form a hormone receptor complex. Hormone receptor complex. So this is a protein being bind by, bound by something else. And so when that hormone is bound by something else, it changes its shape, which changes its function. If the receptor is like the glucocorticoids, which are always found cytosolic, they actually then are triggered to translocate into the membrane. Into, I mean, I'm sorry, into the nucleus. Many of these start out in the nucleus, and the hormone has to cross through the cell, through the nuclear mem membrane or envelope into the nucleus. Act act interacts with the, uh, the the receptor in the nucleus to find form the hormone receptor. So the key here is form a hormone receptor complex and either do that in the nucleus or do that in the cytosol and then move into the nucleus. Right? So once we're in the nucleus, the hormone receptor complex is actually going to interact with response elements, just like we saw with uh, the Creep and binding up on Creep, we have a whole series of DNA sequences for other hormone receptor complexes. So the hormone receptor complex binds that section of the DNA that's now going to be termed hormone response elements for the HRE, HRE. Again, just a sequence of DNA. So it has a specific nucleotide sequence. And it turns out these are pretty specific. So for the androgens, for example, you're going to have an androgen response element. There's a series of different DNA sequences that when the androgen receptor is activated by binding of testosterone or dihydrotestosterone, it will upregulate genes that have a androgen response element sequence within their promoter region or upstream region of the gene. Now, most frequently when a hormone response element is bound by a hormone receptor, Complexes results in other proteins. You'll know these as transcription factors are recruited to the site. They become it becomes conducive for binding of these other transcription factors, and we build up this promoter complex, this uh, series of different proteins that will result in um, the machinery for RNA transcription to occur. So we'll promote transcription. Resulting in a new mRNA molecule that's formed. And then that formed mRNA molecule can be used to generate protein. And now we go from information to function, and we start to have physiological changes that occur in the cell as new proteins, which could be enzymes, channels, receptors, all begin to change how the cell is acting or responding. Everybody doing okay? Now, what's pretty interesting here about the, the hormone receptors that we find in the cytosol uh, is we can actually study these, we've been studying these with different types of drugs that can block uh, certain aspects of this process. 
two main drugs that are used here are actinomycin D which is used to downregulate the transcriptional process and then cyclohexamide which downregulates the translational process. And so by using these drugs, we can look, basically design some intricate experiments where maybe we suspect a certain molecule, or maybe we're doing this in cell culture, we suspect that a certain molecule uh, interacts through a hormone receptor complex. And so if you give that hormone to that cell culture, you see some visible response or some detectable response. So a lot of different places that it could be occurring. If it's a cytosolic, then we're going to probably see transcription. So if we block transcription and we block the effect, that's good evidence that we're probably dealing with a hormone receptor, hormone receptor uh, interaction and a hormone response element. Now, there's some newer evidence that I want to talk to, talk about real quick and just kind of finish up with here. Some newer evidence that hormones like testosterone and the thyroid hormones may actually have what are known as non-genomic effects, non-genomic effects. So this is the idea that these hormones, even though they're programmed to be able to cross right through the membranes, may not actually bind up cytosolic receptors and result in up and down regulation of genes. They may actually uh, interact in a lot of cases with membranes that are bound, I'm sorry, receptors that are bound in the membrane, which is kind of weird because normally they can cross right through the membrane, interact with the receptor, and process messenger RNA. But there's now this evidence that we can bind hormone receptors that are bound in the membrane and lead towards activation of second messenger systems. And this is actually where a lot of these, um, these drugs that inhibit transcription have come in to kind of show this new evidence of non-genomic effects. So take a, a kind of a, a thought experiment here with me. Where we administer one of these steroid hormones, and let's say that it's estrogen. So we administer estrogen to uh, a cell type in cell culture that we know responds to estrogen. So we put estrogen in and we measure some sort of physiological response. Maybe we're looking for a molecule that's upregulated. Maybe we're looking for a change in enzymatic activity. Whatever the case, we administer the hormone. We look for a physiological change. Okay. If I were to do the same experiment and I were to put in an inhibitor, let's say that inhibitor is cyclohexamide which is going to block transcription. So now I no longer can produce messenger RNA molecules, right? If estrogen is causing its physiological response through a genomic effect, I should no longer see that genomic effect or that physiological effect because I've blocked part of the path, right? Is everybody kind of following me? This? That's the ampersand. What has happened is there's been things that have been observed under this inhibitory uh, modality where rapid changes in behavior still occur. So we still observe some sort of physiological change. One of those 
changes has actually been the immune system or an immune response. And what we actually observe here is that there were no new proteins that were produced. And in fact, we prevented those proteins from being pr produced because we blocked transcription with our inhibitor. So we're not producing any new messenger RNA. When we don't produce new messenger RNA, we can't produce proteins. Um, no, both of them block transcription. Did I just? Oh, I'm sorry. That should have been transcription there. They both block transcription. Was a miscue on my part. Either way, we're not producing new proteins when we downregulate transcription. And so the interpretation, the natural interpretation here, is that we actually may be binding a whole different set of receptors. And it turns out as they began to parse this effect further, they began to find membrane-bound receptors that could be bound by some of these steroid hormones. So there's a G protein that estrogen can bind to. Estrogen uh, normally, or what we would refer to as canonically, will bind two different isoforms of an estrogen receptor. One of them is called the estrogen receptor alpha. The other one's estrogen receptor beta. Both of those are cytosolic steroid receptors. So estrogen crosses the membrane and goes through this classic genomic pathway and leads towards up and down regulation of genes. But we now know that there are G-linked proteins bound up in the membrane that estrogen also interacts with and opens up a completely new set of physiological responses. And these are new, new discoveries that are being made even in the common in, in the current time, where we're looking at new effects that these molecules are having through their um, through their non-genomic or membrane-bound receptor pathways. Action. <laughs>